You and other members of Congress say, yeah, well, there were some people threatening martial law, but we don't, you know, you know, think they meant it. They were just trying to to fear monger, which I call mm -hmm. terrorism into it. That's a huge issue. Specifically, sir, we need to know names. Who told you that they were told that uh, martial law and blood in the streets, as you said, what happened? Private conversations between members on the floor, you, you really can't reveal without the, the permission of the other I party. understand, but were there arm twisters coming up or were they scared? I mean, how was it said specifically? What we have to do is expose those circumstances where we're bailing out a particular firm and how many of the executives at that firm are continuing to make a million dollars a year, five million dollars a year, twenty million dollars a year. There is going to be a lot of information that is not public and it's going to take investigative reporters to find out things that congressmen can't find out and that the public is not going to be aware of. You know, I have to, I have to go right now, but uh, it's been a pleasure being with you. Somebody in D.C. was feeding you guys quite a story prior to the bailout, a story that if we didn't do this, if we didn't do this, we were going to see something on the scale of the uh, of the Depression. We were t There were people that were talking about, um, you know, martial law being instituted, uh, civil unrest, all these kinds of stuff. Who was feeding you this information? That's Henry Paulson. We had a uh, conference call early on. It was on a Friday, I think uh, a week and a half before this the vote on October 1st. So it would have been the middle, what was it, 19th, the 19th of September, okay. we had a, a conference call. Uh, in, in this conference call, and I, I guess there's no reason that, for me not to repeat what he said, but he, he painted this picture you just described. He said, this is serious. This is the most serious thing that we face. It's far going to be far worse than the Great Depression of the 30s. And uh, all these things, he was very descriptive of exactly what would happen if, if we didn't buy out these toxic assets, okay. which he abandoned uh, the, the day after he got the money. Okay, here's our top story. Obama signed this seven days ago on January 11, 2010. And I spent a few days reading over it, checking the U.S. code, checking the laws that it mentions, and it ties into Presidential Decision Directive 51 signed by Bush. And remember, Congress wanted to get the full Presidential Decision Directive and accompanying executive order? Would be prudent to have a plan to provide for the continuity of government and the rule of law in case of a devastating terrorist attack. The Bush administration tells us they have such a plan, but now they've denied the entire Homeland Security Committee of the United States House of Representatives. And Bush declared national security and wouldn't even let Homeland Security Committee, which is supposedly co-equal with the president, wouldn't even let them have access to it. Uh, but the cover sheet stated that for any emergency, including economic, anywhere in the world, that the executive is over the legislative and judicial, over the courts, over the Congress, which is unconstitutional. We're supposed to have separation of powers. The people aren't supposed to be divided, what the government always tries to do. The government's supposed to be divided so that you can't ever get a dictatorship. Well, this is what the founders said. This is what America is. It's why we love the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. So President Bush signed this National Security Directive, and it says the continued government program will enhance the credibility of our national security posture and enable more rapid, effective response and recovery, and it goes on. The catastrophic emergency means any incident, regardless of location in the world, that results in extraordinary levels of mass casualties, damages, or disruption severely affecting the U.S. population, infrastructure, environment, economy, or government functions. And under this, the president is over the governors, he's over the legislatures of the states, he's over the Congress, and Congress has no authority. And then Congress asked for the full secret document, and it's still classified to this day. Obama has continued breaking his promise of transparency and has not released the full text of this and other memorandum. Connected into this is his new announcement. His new announcement. He is creating, with this executive order titled Establishment of the Council of Governors, it says here in the document that they are taking the governors, the states, uh, the police forces, everything under the control of NORTHCOM, that's the Pentagon, 
and Homeland Security. But don't worry, the states have their say. The president is going to appoint the 10 members, five governors from the Republican and five governors from the Democrats. Kind of like Bush called the 9-11 Commission uh, independent when he appointed it, or Janet Reno appointed her own Waco investigation team. This would be like Hitler uh, appointing his own Nuremberg judges. I mean, it, it's or, or Al Capone at his own uh, court case. I mean, it's just absolutely ridiculous. And there it is at whitehouse.gov, the executive order for anyone uh, that wishes uh, to see that for themselves. Separately, I have the Rand Corporation's plan that they uh, put out last year. And this plan, the Stability Police Force of the United States, justification options for creating U.S. capabilities. This has already been implemented covertly in the last 15 years. But now they're just being open about it. And it has all the maps here of how uh, Stability Police Force headquarters to run your local city, they have uh, systems for medium-sized police forces, uh, large police forces. They have the stability unit for small police units. Again, communist Russia had this. Communist China has this. Russian news is freaking out, saying America gets its own Politburo. On the Richter scale of tyranny, this is about a 10. And it goes back, because now all these conservative groups are going, oh my gosh, it's martial law. No, oh my gosh, you know, Obama's having a big power grab. And yes, he is. But Obama is just the teleprompter reading minion or front man, just like Bush was. He's just better than Bush was at it. It is the system that's doing this. Big central banks threatened martial law in early October of 2008. Give the trillions, not 700 billion, but trillions of dollars. The overriding issue is we are under martial law right now. In 1986, under Rex 84, they opened 12 secret army camps to test if they could keep them secret while they held federal. Now they hold state prisoners as well. Federal prisoners would then be given a few years off their sentence if they agreed to not tell family about it and to go to the labor camps. It is a labor camp, and under the uh, revised military rules, it allows any U.S. citizens to be put in it under forced labor. Uh, here is the Civilian Inmate Labor Camp Program Army Regulation 210-35. It's exactly 30 pages long. I suggest you Google Civilian Inmate Labor Camp Program. Even if you don't have a computer, go to the library. This is important. Now, this is the big piece of news. This is to establish setting up prison labor camps, negotiations with correctional systems representing representatives to establish prison camps, governing criteria, civilian inmate labor camps, policy statement, governing provisions for operating civilian inmate prison camps on Army installations, procedures for establishing a civilian inmate prison camp on Army installations, infrastructure, inter-service, inter-agency, and inter-departmental support agreements, working with local police at the FEMA camps. In 2002, I published my book, Descent into Tyranny. I've been covering it since 97 when it was declassified, but I put it in my book, Descent into Tyranny. This sucker was set up in 1986 at 12 camps. It's since doubled to 24. And from 86 to 97, secretly at labor camps, U.S. citizens, non-military uh, prisoners, were worked on FEMA camps. Now, this was beta testing. They would tell them, you'll be given leniency and only serve half your sentence if you agree to labor. The minute you don't, you'll be sent back on these military bases, but you can't tell anybody national security. See, they were testing, can we keep camps secret from local police or get them to work with us? Can we keep camps secret from the media? So for 11 years, they kept this sucker secret. Reagan... Bush, Clinton, and then Clinton declassifies it and says it's a good thing in 97, and they double the number. We had secret copies of this when I first got on air in about 95, 96, with just the cover sheet of it, and people made fun of us and didn't believe it. Then it was declassified. This is from Army.mil. So here it is, the big kahuna. This is just one section of these, training the troops, training the infrastructure, creating the larger cadres to expand the archipelago of gulags.
New legislation authorizes FEMA camps in the United States. And it says six major camps across the country with hundreds of sub-region camps. Now, if you watch my films and read the documents we put out, that's exactly what we said the camps are and how they operate because we reverse engineered all this. The camps are already built. It's when they want to openly announce they're doing it that they then pass a law. And they say, oh, all these shut down military bases that they've been keeping refurbished and putting barbed wire facing in and putting in showers and uh, bunks. And, and we knew that those were to be the FEMA camps. 